the counselor, and of course, nice dinner, comes at a time of great significance. As I often tell my daughter, who's 11, although she tries to pretend that she's older than that, <laughs> you never know which events and actions of the day become the stuff written about in history tomorrow. I firmly believe tonight we are joining with the people of Myanmar in making a moment in history which will be written between our two countries. The U.S. Eyes and Fence Council is very proud of the contributions we've made to this bilateral relationship, both before sort of the 2010 period when sort of the conditions changed, as of course as well after. You see, the USABC has been a frequent guest of honor at ASEAN ministerial meetings for over two decades. And then our members routinely held discussions with ASEAN officials, which of course included officials from Myanmar. I often wondered what the impact was, if any, of Myanmar watching year after year of their ASEAN neighbors benefiting from the types of trade and investment partnerships with U.S. companies that were being created, which of course they were not really able to participate in. Of course, the years of showing up, and of course all of you who know about doing business in Asia, as well as diplomacy, showing up. The years of showing up, and of course establishing some of those relations at the working level, really paid off for the council and allowed us in 2012 to lead our historic first senior executive's business mission to Myanmar. And we've done a business mission to Myanmar every year since. Even before Dong Sun Suu Kyi became the state councilor, she graciously met with our delegations each and every year that we've been to Myanmar. And we hope that as we prepare for our 2016 business mission to Myanmar in November 15 through 17, we hope again she will find time to be a delegation. Tonight is not just about a moment in time, because we all know time never stops. Sometimes I'm often reminded of that fact that every morning I wake up and I see one more gray hair on my head. Tonight also really reflects, though, the arc of engagement, marked by cycles where we said there's been the ending of one period and the beginning of another. I think the statements that we've heard from President Obama and the State Council in the last 24 to 48 hours signal to all of us that we are at a transition towards a new period in this relationship. Before inviting Ben Rose to introduce our guest of honor, I'd like to first thank him and the Obama administration and all the colleagues through all the branches of the bureaucracy as a former U.S. government employee, member of the Foreign Service. I know it's, it's oftentimes a tough job for really for the work and for the partnerships, both with the government of Myanmar as well as with the U.S. business community in supporting processes of political, economic, and legal reforms which fundamentally are being led by the people of Myanmar. For those who don't know Ben, he was born in New York City, graduate of Rice and NYU, and has become an established Asia hand in this town, as we're oftentimes called. But more importantly, he's developed a real passion for Southeast Asia, because as we always say at the council, there are enough folks doing stuff around China and India. We need more folks doing stuff around Southeast Asia. As President Obama's assistant and deputy national security advisor for strategic communications and speech writing, some say he has played a role in almost everything this administration has done in Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ben Rose to introduce our guest on this evening. Thank you for that. Um, and I want to thank the uh, U.S. ASEAN Business Council and the Chamber of Commerce uh, for organizing this dinner. Um, it, it's a unique uh, circumstance to introduce somebody who does not need any introduction. Um, but I will just use the opportunity to make a few comments about uh, this uh, particular moment in the relationship between the United States and Burma. Uh, I do want to begin by uh, noting how important this event is uh, to us. Uh, when I was able uh, to extend the invitation from President Obama to Da Aung San Suu Kyi in July to visit, uh, she made very clear that one of her goals would be to meet with the U.S. business community to try to promote trade and investment uh, and greater economic ties between the United States and Burma. Uh, and I think this gives the State Council a very good platform to speak uh, to some of the leaders within our business community about her vision uh, for Burma and about uh, the partnership that we can build together. Uh, of course, uh, we are reminded here tonight that for decades, U.S. policy towards Burma has been very much focused on promoting the democratic aspirations of its people. 
Uh, it's been a shared goal of multiple U.S. administrations and Congress, particularly since the crackdown by the government's military in 1988 uh, and the subsequent refusal to allow Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD to take power after their overwhelming victory in 1990. So I do want to begin by just noting the extraordinary bipartisanship that has characterized this policy over many years. Um, there are not many things that Republicans and Democrats can consistently agree on in Washington, but one of them is our support for democracy in Burma uh, and our support for Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, and uh, I was reminded of that yesterday uh, at the breakfast uh, that we had with a number of members of Congress, uh, including uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, who has been a true champion for democracy in, in Burma, and who we owe a great debt of gratitude uh, for the progress that's been made. Uh, I won't uh, go on at length. Uh, I'll just uh, note, of course, that the President has made uh, Southeast Asia a centerpiece uh, of his foreign policy, a centerpiece of his rebalance uh, to the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and Burma has been at the center of that effort because of uh, the extraordinary opening and progress uh, that has been made uh, in the pursuit of democracy. But we also have to recognize that Burma has extraordinary economic potential. Uh, and as it moves forward with this transition, uh, we should see it as an, an opportunity for U.S. businesses, uh, just as investment and trade between our two countries provides us with an opportunity to ensure that there is a clear dividend uh, through this transition to democracy. Um, we've taken some important steps around this visit uh, to try to open the door uh, to greater economic ties. Uh, yesterday, the President announced uh, a number of changes on sanctions and a generalized system of preferences, uh, which we believe is going to open up, uh, again, the door to many opportunities. Uh, I should note on GSP that this comes after a lengthy dialogue and work with the Burmese government, which has taken some critical steps in support of labor rights and labor reforms, uh, and we're going to continue to work with them as they implement those changes. Uh, but we believe that, again, GSP uh, will be an important signal uh, of our uh, commitment uh, to promoting greater economic ties. Similarly, the President announced that in the coming days, uh, we will be uh, lifting our economic sanctions uh, through the termination of the national emergency uh, with respect to Burma. Uh, I know that this has been a priority for many people in this room and many people that I've spoken to when I traveled to Burma. Um, you know, I will say that uh, we've heard that uh, the chill on investment, uh, the risk that is associated with the presence of a sanctions regime, like uh, our executive order, uh, was an obstacle. Uh, to companies investing. Uh, so as I've said to some of the people coming in today, uh, we've heard from you, and now's the time for you to invest. Uh, we've taken the step uh, to try to open up this space, uh, and we believe uh, that there uh, now is not an impediment from our sanctions, uh, and in fact, there is extraordinary opportunity, particularly given uh, the steps that the government is taking. Um, I'll just note a few of those. In addition to the labor reforms I mentioned, uh, we've seen the government pursuing economic policies that promote a better climate for investment, uh, an investment that is high quality that can facilitate job creation and broader based economic growth. Uh, we've seen major financial sector reforms, including a new financial services law uh, and a new digital financial services regulation. We've seen microfinance reforms. Uh, we've seen ministers digging in uh, and making sure that they're creating a climate, again, that not just attracts investment, but attracts investment that benefits the people of Burma. Broadly. Uh, and that is a part of uh, the transition to democracy, building an economy that works for everybody, uh, not just a few. Uh, and I know that that is something that is uh, very important uh, to uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, before uh, I turn over uh, the floor to her, I just do think it's always worth stepping back and reflecting on how extraordinary this visit is and how extraordinary this moment uh, is. Uh, I was with uh, President Obama in uh, 2011. Uh, when he was traveling to Bali for the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Summits. Uh, and that was at the very beginning of our uh, opening and our engagement with the government as they were taking some steps uh, to pursue incremental reforms. Uh, his very clear direction to us was, I'm not going to announce anything uh, unless I speak to Aung San Suu Kyi first. Uh, so he was able to call her from uh, Air Force One, uh, consult with her about uh, whether it was an appropriate risk to take, and we recognize there's a risk uh, to pursue engagement. Uh, and since then, at every juncture, uh, he has very much enjoyed the ability to consult with her uh, as this process has gone forward. Now, I would note uh, that in that process, uh, he has been struck by 
the extraordinary work ethic, determination, commitment, and passion that she has shown uh, for the people of Burma. Uh, obviously, uh, many of us came to know her as an icon for democracy. But over the course of the last several years, uh, the president has worked with her not as an icon, but as a parliamentarian, as a candidate for office, uh, and now as a state counselor. Uh, and she, at every step of the way, uh, has been focused on ensuring that the democratic transition goes forward, but also ensuring that there are concrete benefits for the people of Burma uh, that accompany democracy. Um, and so this visit, in our view, uh, marks yet another milestone in the history of our relationship. Uh, we are truly honored uh, to welcome uh, Da Su here, uh, and we are going to do everything we can uh, to try to ensure that uh, her government, uh, the NLD-led government, both continues uh, a transition to democracy that is complete, uh, that includes a full process of transition to civilian control of the military, that includes a national reconciliation within the country, but importantly also includes much deeper people-to-people -people and economic and commercial ties between our countries. Uh, and our hope is that we will look back uh, years from now and, and see this as a moment uh, when that connection uh, was forged between our countries. Uh, and the process of democratization inside of Burma uh, also led a process uh, of greater, broader-based economic growth benefiting from the type of truly high-quality investment uh, that can come from the people in this room uh, and from the United States of America. So we thank you for being here. Uh, we're honored uh, now to hear from uh, the State Counselor uh, of Burma, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi. Green enough. <laughs> well, it's a green to begin with, but it is a tiny little green spot. Now it's a big green spot. So may I thank all of you again for welcoming me here and giving me this opportunity to talk to you. If I sound a little sleepy, it's not because the company is sovereignty, because, but because I'm still suffering from jet, jet lag. But still, this is too good an opportunity to miss, and I would like to talk to all of you about what Ben Rose has already talked about, but what which I think I can, to which I think I can add something, not too much, because Ben's been very comprehensive. I would like to underline the political aspects of the economic transition that we're trying to achieve. Ours is basically a political transition, but in order to make the political tra transition work, we have to have the economic expectations of our people fulfilled as well. Now, uh, as you all know, we have witnessed the lifting of sanctions after many years. Those sanctions went into place because of the efforts of good friends of Burma who wanted us to be able to decide our own destiny, who wanted to give the people of, of Burma the chance to shape the country in the image in which they brought it to be fashioned. It was because of this that our very good friends in Capitol Hill worked hard to make sure that sanctions were imposed on a regime that was not respecting the rights of the people, that had no interest in democratization. But we decided that the time had come for these sanctions to be lifted. In some ways, it is a risk. It is as much a political as an economic risk. Because there are those who believe that it is not yet time for us to remove the sanctions. But we think that it is time now for our people to depend on themselves, to go forward with the help of our, of our friends. I can never thank Senator, Senator McConnell, Senator McCain, 
from Congressman Joe Crowley, Madeline, and other friends who have worked so hard to help us to achieve the democracy that our people have been longing for. <coughs> democracy for us is not just a word, it's a way of life. It's security, it's freedom, it's a chance to make our lives meaningful as well as materially rich. And this comes down to economics. I have to keep repeating that in my country, as in I suppose other countries all over the world, politics cannot be divorced from economics. Our economy can succeed only if our political system succeeds. And for this, we look to you who are in favor of promoting business in Burma to help us to succeed politically as well as economically. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be able to talk to you and to explain to you why we need the help of good businessmen. I've said repeatedly that I have no use for businesses that cannot make profit for themselves. If you can't make profit for yourself, you can't make profit for us. And that's what we want. We want you to come to our country in order to help our country to progress. I was very fortunate in being able to discuss matters with the members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Argent Business Council just before this dinner, and uh, to listen to their concerns. I, of course, have a prepared uh, speech, sort of prepared, uh, but I want to respond to what we discussed at the meeting before this dinner, and they showed me very kindly that they wouldn't mind listening to it all over again. Uh, why it is, this is an important time for our country, both politically and economically, is because we have been given only part of a chance to democratize. Our country is not yet fully a working democracy. There are many things that need to be changed. To begin with, the Constitution, which is not wholly a democratic one. We have to prove that democracy works. And what will prove that democracy in its work is a visible and sustainable improvement in the lives of our people. That is what it has all been about. When we were working for democracy, we were working for democracy not because it was a particular political ideology that we thought needed to be supported, but because we thought that it was would enable our people people to achieve a way of life that would be more meaningful and the kind of life that you would like to happily pass on to future generations. So our democratic process has been the process of trying to make the lives of our people more secure, more free, more meaningful, more secure materially as well as mentally, emotionally. So in spite of the fact that our two countries is divided by, I was going to say many miles, but at the moment I think I'd like to say many hours because of the time difference, uh, which, which means so much to me at the moment. But although we, we are separated by such a big gap, we are close to each other, I think, in our goodwill towards the people of my country. I think everybody in this room would wish very much to be a success story. Not just because we are, have been fighting for democracy, because I, not because I do believe that all of you care for us as fellow human beings. We are now, we have now started on the path to democracy. I always say that when the first elections, uh, free and fair, uh, free and fair to a certain extent, elections uh, were set, ha held in 2010, that the door had been opened, but we had not yet stepped out onto the path. Now we have stepped out onto the path, but it's a long one. And we have to make sure that we manage to keep going in spite of the obstacles, the stones, the thorns, the diversions. Um, well, we are monsoon country, the muck, the mud. So all these have to be overcome. And we want to overcome them with the help of our friends from all over the world. We are confident that we have every chance of success, but success will never come easily, and 
we have many political issues that we have to address in our country if we are to help it to progress economically. For example, peace. The peace process is extremely important for us. The peace process is linked to the idea of a true democratic union. That is what our ethnic peoples want. And if I say that officially there are 135 ethnic groups in our country, you will see how great the challenge is. And a number of our larger ethnic groups have been in armed rebellion almost since the time of independence. That means that since we became independent in 1948, there has never been a time when we can say that the whole of the country is at peace. We have never had such an opportunity. Now we have this rare opportunity to achieve peace. We hope a permanent peace. This has to be negotiated. We believe in negotiation. The National League for a Democracy has always believed in the path of non-violence. It may be a longer path, it may be a harder path, but we feel, we believe that this is the right path for our country. And through non-violent tactics, through adhering to our principles of non-violence and of national reconciliation, we have now come to this point when we can start working for national reconciliation as the government of the country and not as an oppressed opposition. Part of the reconciliation process has, been, has to be the provision of better life for all our ethnic people. And that's where we come in. That's where business comes in. That's where investment comes in. Our country is rich in natural resources, but our most valuable resource is our people. So one of the first, our first priorities is capacity building. And we, we discussed this earlier at the meeting before the dinner, that we need to build up the capacity of our people, the capacity to do business, the capacity to make the most of the investment that we hope will come to us from you. What we want is responsible investment, best practices. We are coping not just with an economy that is poorly developed, that uh, a financial system that leaves much to be desired, and uh, with a people who have been deprived of quality education for decades. We are also having to struggle with a system that has not exactly been um, uh, been very enthusiastic about promoting integrity. That is to say, we have a problem of corruption. So we need your help in this as well. We need investment from people who are prepared to work with us in our battle against corruption. A country that is undermined by corrupt practices is a country that will never make it a sustainable development stage. So when we invite you to invest in our country, we are inviting you to bring good practices with you, best practices, to make sure that our country economy, as it develops, to take its place with the rest of the world, with the rest of our world, we come to that a little later, uh, is doing so in the right way. Um, our country, when people talk about Burma, they talk about its potential. But we have to keep saying that potential is yet unrealized. And there is so much that we have to do. Our neighbors, the Asian countries, have gone ahead of us. And yet, at the time we became independent, we were very proud of the fact that we were seen as the country most likely to succeed in Southeast Asia. Our education system was good. Our health care system was sound. Our people were enthusiastic, our leaders were purposeful, and we had the future glowing in front of us. But we have been disappointed in our hopes. Our friends have been disappointed in our hopes. Our people have been disappointed in their dreams. And mainly because of politics. Our country did not turn into a military dictatorship for 
cause of economic, economic problems. But when we were, when we became um, a country ruled by military authority in 1962, we were not suffering from economic problems. It was politics that led our country down the path of economic stagnation. So we must not neglect we must not ignore the importance of politics in our country. I say this because some people say that my party cares too much for politics and not enough for economics. We care for politics because we know how important politics is to our country and what a big role it has played in the economic stagnation from which we have suffered over the years. So I hope you will understand that every move that we make, we have to make with politics in mind. For example, we agreed at our dinner that one of our two of our greatest needs were uh, construction, that is to say roads, and energy, that is to say electrification. But when we think about electrification, we naturally think of hydroelectric power because that is renewable and that is readily available in our country. But at the same time, we have to think of the fact that the sources of this power lie in the ethnic areas and that electricity, uh, the generation of electricity is as much a political as well as an economic and technical challenge. We have to look to all these. We cannot afford to ignore the political aspect of economic development. So we want you to be aware of these sensitivities and to understand that when we think of building a dam here uh, or there, we can't, can't decide just on the grounds of whether it's going to be technically a good idea or not. We have to start by making sure that it is politically acceptable to all our people. Nothing is more important for economic progress than stability. You all know that. You are business people. You do not want to invest in a country that cannot guarantee stability, that cannot guarantee peace. So you will understand why we put such a premium on our peace process, on our political, on our need for political uh, change, on our need for rule of law, which I think you would agree with me is important for your security. When I would say when rather than if, when you invest in our country. So we would like you to invest, we would like you to create jobs. That is our first priority, job creation. Because our people need the dignity of being able to earn their own living. And our young people need hope for the future. So job creation is extremely important. We want to keep our families together. Now many of our young people leave the country because they cannot find work. In, in, in our country, they go abroad. Many of them go abroad as illegal workers, illegal migrant workers, and that puts them in great danger. So we need jobs. We need jobs for our people to keep our families together, to give hope to our young people, to give security to our old people, to make sure that we will be able to catch up with our neighbors. And we would like you to help build up the capacity of our people, our skills in every area. We need help with our education system. We need help with our health care system. Help with our health care system. So we welcome businesses which are interested in outreach programs to help the community in which they are doing business. And we believe that by investing in our country, you will be reaping enormous benefits as well. Not just monetary benefits, but also the benefits that you will get from knowing that you have contributed to a great change that a country has been awaiting for decades. People forget that we have been under military rule for more than half a century. It was 1962 when the military government that established authoritarian rule came into power. There was a coup in 1958, but uh, in 1960 we had democratic elections. But once again in 1962 there was this coup, and 
until now, we have not really shaken off the, the legacy that's produced about the, of military rule because the Constitution has been written in such a way that it gives the military a special place in the political process of our country. I personally am very fond of the military for the very simple, very emotional fact that it was founded by my father. It was my father who founded the Burmese army and who guarded it. Because when he founded it, it was an institution loved, respected by the people, an institution on which the people depended, which they believed would defend them, would protect their honor and their security. Things change along the way, but we are confident that we can return to a situation where, once again, our army will be the kind of institution of which my father dreamt when he found it. But, as I said, we are still not totally a democracy. The Constitution gives the military a special place. And economic success is one of the ways in which we can persuade everybody in our country, including the military, that democracy is the best way forward for our union. This is the best way forward for us to achieve unity and prosperity. We can't have one without the other. And we're trying to achieve both together. So, if you are competent business people, and I trust that you are, and that if you're uh, and that if you aren't, you won't be interested in coming to our country. Uh, you will make sure that you will prosper. And I think at the same time, you will make sure that we prosper as well. And that would be the beginning of a good partnership between the business community of the United States and my country. So, um, let me talk to you a little bit about our investment policy. I can't talk to you too, about it in too much detail, first of all because of the time factor, secondly because I'm a bit sleepy, and thirdly because the investment law has not yet been passed by the legislature. It's in the pipeline. Uh, until, until a few months ago, we had two investment laws, a foreign investment law and an investment law for, uh, for, uh, for domestic purposes. But this was not really acceptable, a lot of our um, our friends from other countries assured us that this is not the right way to go about uh, writing an investment law. And so we decided that we would uh, do what would be most assuring, reassuring for those who wish to invest in our country, whether they be uh, foreigners or whether they be our own citizens. So we have drawn up this new investment law. This is in the pipeline. Uh, there may be changes to what the draft because that is the prerogative of the legislature and we'll have to wait for the legislature to look at it and to decide whether they accept it as it is or whether there are changes that we would like made to it. But uh, apart from the law, what we want to do is to simplify, simplify and speed up the procedures that investors must follow. We wanted to make it not just easy, but pleasant for you to invest in our own country. And that means that we have to streamline uh, our institutions with which you will have to deal. Our ministries will need to be more efficient. I've talked about uh, integrity earlier, and uh, over during our meeting earlier, I was saying that we would welcome uh, any report of any signs of corruption if you come across it while you're in our country. You have to tell us. We will not be able to keep an eye on every single person with whom you have to deal. And if anybody suggests that you, uh, you are a little bit economical with your integrity in order to make it that you set the wheels going, you'll have to inform them. And you can inform the minister concerned or you can write to my office. We would be very grateful for that kind of cooperation. So when you're trying to invest in Burma, please don't think that you have to go with a suitcase bursting with dollar bills. Well, not, not to discuss along the way, to invest in a proper, 
legal way, yes, we welcome any, any, any number of suitcases full of dogs. <laughs> but please help us to build up a business practice that is free from corruption. We, we believe in uh, responsibility. Responsible business practices, responsible government practices. And we hope that we can help each other to strengthen our ability to do business honestly and efficiently. As uh, part of our commitment to the strengthening of rule of law in our country, we are establishing a credible uh, dis dispute settlement procedure. We have already acceded to the New York Convention on Arbitration, and we have this year enact enacted an arbitration law that follows closely to the recommendation of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law. We will protect foreign investors' rights to remit profits once tax obligations have been met. And we would li like you to help us to build up a tax culture. Well, you were the ones who said no taxation without a representation, etc., etc. And so now we, we want to make it the other way around as well, no representation without taxation, or rather no investment without taxes. You have to help our people to understand that taxes are desirable. Uh, we have adopted the simple principle of transparency to let our people know what we use the taxes that we get from them for, to make them understand why it's a good idea for them to pay taxes. It's better for them all together. I, I like to explain that we had a little, a little challenge at the very beginning of our new administration because a new tax was, uh, was tailored, shall we say, to come into effect immediately the next day after our new administration took over. It was going to be a tax of 5% on all, all a handful of calls. Now, of course, this affected a great number of people in our country because although we are not that advanced technically, there are many, many um, handphones, cell phones going around, and our people have got used to using them. So the moment our administration came into office, uh, the, each call was going to cost 5% more. And uh, we discussed it very seriously before, um, before we took over that. We wondered whether there was something um, not quite uh, not quite innocent about this arrangement, but anyway, we were we were prepared to meet the challenge. We decided that what we would do would be to be totally transparent about the whole procedure with our people. So we announced that uh, the phone bills were going to go up by five. Each call is going to cost five percent more. This was the new regulation, but we also let the public know how much we expected to get from this, this new, new tax. And we made quite clear that this would be spent on either health or education, uh, some kind of project to do with either health or education. And this is what we did, and we let everybody know exactly how the money had been spent. And nobody complained. Nobody said, now we have to pay 5% more. We were all pleased. They were satisfied that the money that had been taken from them, from them was going to be spent for them. So we're going to tax you, of course. Uh, we expect you to make the kind of profit that will have to be taxed, and we hope that the tax will be big and fat, because and, and I'm sure you should, you should hope that too, because it will mean that you will be making big and fat profits as well. So we work together. We work together to succeed, and uh, we, are, we are committed to protecting investors against arbitrary uh, expropriation. And I think you would like to hear this, because our country has not exactly had a good record of, uh, of protecting pe people's businesses. Um, our economic policy, well, I think uh, Ben Rose has talked a lot about it, so I don't know whether I need to repeat too much of it. I think it's been written up but really short. It would be a pity to waste all this. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, we will improve our public financial management through greater budget transparency and improved efficiency in public spending. We are also committed to the EITR, we talked about that earlier, uh, which will help us to account for earnings from natural resources. We are assessing our existing state-owned enterprises and will be seeking to privatize appropriate SOEs through open and transparent processes. We will actively promote the role of small and medium enterprises, improving their ac access to financial services and cutting unnecessary red tape. We intend to foster human capital. In this regard, I'm an advocate of vocational training. Many successful economies have given equal weight to academic and vocational education. I would Burma to follow this path. To expand vocational training opportunities, our government will cooperate closely with the business sector, including foreign investors. We are prioritizing development of the basic infrastructure that both our people and our investors need. Our transport and energy sectors have suffered from decades of neglect and underinvestment. We need reliable power supply, improved roads, upgraded ports, better sanitation. Our government cannot address this infrastructure gap by ourselves alone. We already receive support from international development partners such as the World Bank and Asian Development Bank, but billions of dollars of private sector investment in infrastructure will be required. Billions, please, we do, but we don't talk in millions these days, because our homes are great. In many cases, through, we hope, public-private partnerships. PPP is going to be a very strong element in our economic policy. We particularly welcome your interest in this field. Infrastructure projects can create jobs and develop skills in the short term, and create a physical platform for long-term economic growth. Our government is drafting a digital strategy and a small but growing public sector tech community is already established in Rangoon. Many businesses are now taking advantage of the rapid expansion of 3G mobile networks across Burma. For example, the first mobile money enterprises have recently been launched, which have the potential to change the lives of rural farmers currently without access to formal banking. Our government will support and encourage investment in the agricultural sector. 70% or more of our people work in, in agriculture. Our government has already granted farmers full production freedom, and we are working to expand extension services and access, access to credit. Our country has the potential not only to regain its status as the rice bowl of Asia, but to diversify into high-value crops. And we also want to preserve our traditional, uh, our traditional species. We have a very good gene bank when it comes to agriculture. That is one of the successes of previous administration. And I must take the opportunity to thank those who have helped us to build up these uh, DNA banks. We have very, very good ones. We have been congratulated on, on this by uh, some of our foreign friends who were quite surprised. At quality of our gene banks, and we want to make use of these to develop our agricultural sector in a way that will enable us to provide the world with a kind of products that they can no longer find in many parts of the world today. Um, we want to diversify the high value crops, and for this, we need investments in infrastructure including storage facilities and agricultural technology. And of course, underlying all that is roads, 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 and electrification, electrification, electrification. We are taking steps to liberalize our financial sector, accompanied by rigorous financial supervision. Uh, we want to secure a sovereign credit rating, and we will work hard towards that. We intend to permit the entry of foreign insurance companies that we were talking to uh, those who were interested in this earlier. And we are committed to maintaining and further strengthening anti-money laundering measures. And we want, we want to uh, cooperate with all governments who are interested in helping us in this. 
We intend to develop our big cities in a sustainable and intelligent way to handle the challenges and opportunities of modernization and migration. For this, we will need high quality investment in urban drainage, roads, public transport, and housing. Our needs are many. We will establish a fair and efficient tax system, putting in place just and clear tax regulations that support investment while addressing the currently unsustainable low tax rate. And finally, we will strengthen protection for intellectual property rights in our country so as to foster innovation. So these are, uh, in short, our, the props of our economic policy. And I hope that you find these attractive. And if you think that these could be made more attractive, please tell us, please let us know. We want not, we don't just want to invite investment, we want to invite investment that is satisfactory to you as well as for us. We want to make sure that our partnership is a sustainable one which we can look back uh, as something that was started today here in this room. We would like you to help us in developing our society in such a way that our people learn how to run and to sustain a successful economy. We have to look after ourselves. In the end, that's what it comes to. We have to look after ourselves. We, the people of Burma, must look after ourselves. But we always will need the help and uh, the advice of friends who truly care for our success. I start by talking about politics, although this is supposed to be an, uh, a gathering about business. And I must conclude once again by talking about politics. We have started uh, the National Reconciliation and Peace Program in our country. We started this with the Peace Conference, the 21st Century Pangram, that took place on the 31st of August. At the same time, we are working on problems in the Rakhine State, which are known throughout the world, and which has done great damage to the image of our country. But it is not the image that concerns us so much as the fact that it is a threat to harmony within our society. And that is something that we have to address as effectively and as quickly as possible. At the same time, we are trying to make our ethnic peoples understand that we have to work together to create a truly democratic union, which will ensure equality, and stability and prosperity and most of all peace for all our people. And the role of business in this is not a small one. If you can help us to improve the material condition of our people, it will increase their confidence in the democratic process. And because their confidence in the democratic process is strong, they will be that much more inclined to find ways of agreeing on, uh, on a negotiated settlement that will allow us to construct the union of which our founding fathers dreamt, but which we have not yet seen. This, in the end, is our goal. We want a strong and prosperous union. And Economics is one of the columns, the pillars, that will hold up this union of our dreams. And so I would like to conclude once again by thanking you and by asking you to be with us, to accompany us in our journey towards the realization of the long-held dreams of our people. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our final speaker.
the Vice President for Operations of the U.S. ASEAN Business Council, Ms. Elizabeth Dugan.